What's up, everybody? How you guys doing? Welcome to Leaving the Dream. Today, we're going to go live and talk about the I Remember Psycap shooting. I did go live uh, shortly after that case happened. And so now um, we found out today what I consider great news that the three officers involved in the shooting of I Remember Psycap were have been ruled to not have to stand trial in the murder and in the attempted murder case. I've had many cases with Judge Domingo. And um, it's interesting how different people look at things before they go to trial. You can say what you want. I think it was junk and garbage that these guys got charged. The grand jury chose not to indict. The prosecutor pushed it through. And now the judge has ruled that there was insufficient probable cause to bring these officers up on charges of murder and attempted murder. The judge ruled that there will be no trial. And I think an important thing for us to remember is that they can still appeal. And let's just be honest, based on how things are going right now, the fact that they still went to trial after the grand jury um, decided not to indict and they the prosecutor pushed it through, the judge now has ruled that they won't stand trial. They're probably going to appeal. They're already in it. They're already knee deep. So they're probably going to still appeal. But... I like what Judge Domingo said. It's nothing foreign to a police officer or people that understand law enforcement. He said that no reasonable person would have waited to find out where the gunshots were coming from. And you also have to take into consideration the events that occurred prior to this event. The defense tried to argue that there was no one around the vehicle when they heard the engine revving which is nonsense to me because you can see that there were officers around the car and when the engine is revving, you don't know if it's in drive, you don't know if it's in reverse. And the most important aspect is vehicles have steering wheels and they can turn. And it's interesting to me because that if the prosecution kept saying, oh, there was no officers in the vicinity, but you can clearly see that Officer Fred Luces was to the front of the vehicle on the driver's side when the engine was revving. So I am relieved today. I'm still massively disappointed that this happened. I am happy for my brothers who don't have this nightmare to worry about as much. I mean, there's still an appeal process, but man, is it disappointing. It is so disappointing because their lives have been turned upside down for something that was justified. And they will forever be Googled job interviews, when they're trying to buy a home. Um, Anytime someone looks them up, they're going to see this on the news. And they're not going to remember the officers were justified in the shooting. It's going to be these officers shot somebody and the judge ruled that it was a justified shoot. People don't think in terms of context. It'll be those are the guys that shot the Micronesian boy. This is a risk that all officers take, and this is the risk that all officers knowingly enter into when taking this job. They're told about it all through police academy. The deja vu feeling that these officers must have had of hearing the echoes of all their training officers in the police academy telling them, Be careful to do this. Be careful to do this. Make sure you write this. Make sure you articulate this. Um, Make sure you don't stand here. Make sure blah, 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 because you are going to be tried. Right now, it is not popular to be a police officer. Um, All these things, they could hear them. They could hear them. I know they could hear them. They could hear it echoing all the things that they have been taught. The the media doesn't care about you. You're going to be crucified for this. And people somehow think that those officers were um, 
ignorant of the fact that all that was going to happen. No, they weren't. These aren't just power-hungry, murderous cops that were looking for a chance to shoot somebody. That's not how this works. Some reason people think that a murderous psychopath police officer just squeaks by the vigorous hiring process and then make it through academy seven months and then make it through field training and then make it through fourth watch. And then when they get on the beat, that somehow they make it by all the other good cops. It ain't like that, man. I only worked with one of these guys before. I think the other two came in after I was gone. Um, but from what I hear, they were great officers. And they never wanted to be put in this situation. I do find it interesting, however, that the watch lieutenant, their watch lieutenant, um, had to testify. And I think it was a great thing that he did. I've been hearing a lot about like fear-based policing lately. About how officers need to stop with the fear-based policing and all this, you know. Call it what you want. But you step in their shoes, put that gun belt on and that vest. And you try to tell me that there's not going to be any fear-based policing. That's what policing is. It's to protect people. It's to protect the community from the community. That's what police do. But somehow, the media has painted this picture that there's the beautiful community of people who love people and who wouldn't do anything wrong and they're just out there trying to make a dollar and feed their families. And then there's these wicked, power-hungry things called the police. That's not how this works. It's the community having problems with itself that commission police officers to police the community. The fact that there are police officers means that the community wanted them. And a big thing that people forget is the police are a part of the community, especially in Hawaii. On the mainland, they maybe can have that argument. You know, I had that one video about James Kisselberg on my channel. I will leave a link to it. But the, the thing about mainland police departments, you have huge land, is you don't have to live in the community. And I don't understand, like in this case, you have to understand, you have to realize that that is not how this works in Hawaii. There's no living outside the community. Okay, maybe you live in Kaneohe, but you work in Eva, right? But it's still an island. It's still the same culture. So in Hawaii, you can't not live in the community. These officers shop in the community. I just left a link to that James Kisselberg video. If you haven't watched it, crazy story about a police officer who was doing proactive police work looking for a guy that murdered a police officer five months earlier. He finds the guy. The guy shoots him twice, shoots his partner twice, and the guy never stood trial. I just left that link um, in the description. So I'm going to say what's up, some quick shout outs, and then I'll get into some of these um, articles. What's up, Brokeheart Wolf? Thanks for coming through. I can always count on you to show up. I appreciate the support. Tweak Mode 808 says, amazing news. I agree, bro. Pamela Santos Bermudez, one of my Patreon fam, one of our beloved Patreon Ohana. Appreciate you, Pam. What's up, Kai? How you doing, bro? It's one of the homies. See him every week on our book club. Le Ilima. How you doing, Le? Have fun in LA. PJ Tanag. Aloha, friend. Marshall Brown. Aloha from Big Island. What's up, Marshall? 
Thanks for coming through. Appreciate you. Cynthia, what's up, Sin? Manny Saria. Hello, my brother, he says, from Kona. Big Island in the house today. Abe and Sarah Channel. What's up, Abe? How you doing, bro? Good to see you. Appreciate you, man. I really do. Cam T. Aloha, Doug. Have you ever thought about coming back to Hawaii to run for office? We need guys like you. You don't need nobody like me in um, politics. Power corrupts, my bro. Everybody. But yeah, I think about coming back to Hawaii every day. I miss Hawaii for sure. 100%. Let's see. Over here. Mary Palafox. How you doing, Mary? Thanks for coming through. Gail Tama, Aloha. Kingston's Pride. Always coming out, showing support. Appreciate you, bro. Nate Fleming in the house. How you doing? Another Patreon fam. Cedric McBain. What's up, Cedric? How you doing? Appreciate you guys. Terry Bear in the house. What's up, Terry? Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back in time a little bit. We're going to start in... This is posted... Go back to April. When all this stuff happened, okay? Johnny Walker in the house. What's up, Johnny Walker? From Phuket, Thailand. Wow, that's you're easily our furthest streamer. Appreciate you for coming out. Um, so we're talking April 5th, right? The Honolulu police officers, who we all know, Jeffrey Tom, Zach Ani, and Chris Fredeluces, amongst several other police officers. We're on the traffic stop and who knows how many charges these guys are facing for all the crimes they committed of the white Honda Accord and they were shooting into the car. There were six suspects inside aged 14 to 22. What a crazy scene. They were driving a stolen car that was reported stolen in Kailua, had been linked to a series of crimes including a car theft in Kaimuki, a purse snatching in Waikiki, and an armed robbery in Mo'ili'ili just 20 minutes before the shooting. 20 minutes, y'all. That's what Judge Domingo was talking about when he said... You have to take into consideration the events that occurred prior to the traffic stop. And he's right. That's how this works. You can't tell me that there's not a difference between you doing a traffic stop as a police officer. Normal traffic stop. Just a regular traffic stop. Dude was speeding or blew the red light or whatever. At the corner of Kalakaua and Kapiolani. And compare that to a traffic stop where a police officer hears on the radio that there was an armed robbery 20 minutes earlier with that suspect car. Gun used. By the way, the same car that we've been telling you guys about in lineup. With the purse snatching, another car theft in Kaimuki. They've been tearing up the community. People calling in all the time, scared, wanting to know what's going on. You're hearing this in lineup for days. Not to mention, you know this fool. And then you see that car. You hear on the radio, high speed chase. Pursuit declared. Radios cleared. Is there not a difference between those two? Yes, there's a difference between those two. Let's not pretend like there isn't. So where one guy doesn't get shot 
and the other does get shot, it's very clear that there are extenuating circumstances to the traffic stop where Sidecap was killed. Those police officers knew that a gun was involved. That dude, car full of people, you don't know their ages, you don't know how many of them in there, you don't know what they've done. They won't stop, they crash, they rev the engine, police are out with their guns drawn. The other thing to remember is when an officer has his gun drawn and the suspect is not listening, that is more indicia that, a, that an officer has to think about. Do you know that there is a difference between the split second that an officer draws his weapon on somebody who is inside the car during a felony traffic stop, remember we have probable cause, and the officers are allowed and required by policy to draw their weapons on a felony traffic stop. But there is a difference in that split second from where the officer is pointing his weapon during a felony traffic stop and when the person in the vehicle is not listening and revving the engine and trying to drive the car. There is two different things there. There's already a threat level, right? There's already a threat level that's, you know, let's say it's at 60%, 70%. And then the guy puts it in drive or reverse and revs the engine. The threat level definitely goes up. First of all, it doesn't matter if there's anyone standing by him. Just the fact that a person who knows that an officer has drawn their weapon on them on a felony stop is not obeying commands. That shows more intent and it even shows state of mind. Add to that the fact that Officer Chris Fedelusais was standing at the front left of the vehicle when the engine was being revved. And you don't know if it's in drive or park. It was in either neutral or park. And it was revving. So it was gonna, he was going to do a whole shot. He was going to pop it. It was either going to jump back or jump forward. Those are the things you got to think about when that initial officer fired. Well, then the other officers hear gunshots. They don't know in that moment who's firing. And that's what the judge talked about when he said any reasonable person wouldn't have known where those shots were coming from and would have taken into consideration the events leading up to that traffic stop and high-speed chase. This isn't over because the media is still going to portray this as some kind of a hiccup in the case. And I think that there's a lot to learn from this from all of us. We can all learn from this. I bet you those kids in that car learned from it too. I know those three officers learned from it. I know that they know that you can just be doing your job, what you're trained to do. And the media, who weren't at your training, who don't know enough to train you, and most of the public, who don't know enough to train you, and were not at your training, they don't know what you know, they're not going to be on your side at first. And that is a priceless lesson to learn. But it wasn't free. Those officers paid for it. They sure paid for it. And I'm so grateful that now they can go home to their families. And they can breathe. Because even though the prosecution can appeal, it is going to be difficult to get a conviction when you have both a grand jury declined to indict and now a judge say that there was insufficient 
probable cause. And remember, that's what the grand jury was for. A grand jury, their job is to decide whether there was probable cause for the suspects, and in this case it was the three officers, to stand trial. Because they don't want to waste going to trial months and months and months and months and hundreds of thousands of dollars just to find out there wasn't probable cause. Since probable cause is the first thing you need to build a case. And it has to be determined in court, which is judicial determination of probable cause. We call it JDPC. Now you have both the grand jury and the judge saying there wasn't probable cause. Probable cause is a standard that basically means that a reasonable person from the community acting in a reasonable frame of mind would have made the same decision. Made a reasonable determination for either the use of force or the arrest. In this case, it's weird because it was the officers on trial, right? The JDPC, the, the probable cause was if the prosecution had enough probable cause to indict the officers to stand trial. So it's going to be hard to get a conviction on that. You have precedence already. And it's going to be difficult to convince a jury in a case that the jury before them was wrong and the judge who's trained in law was wrong. And I will say this, big shout out to Hawaii because the overwhelming majority of the comments that I saw online, which a lot of times trolls, especially when it comes to the police, they have had it with this politically correct reaching that the media has taken part in. They just had it. And they were standing up. Because they, this time they understood that the police are a part of the community. That's what's so special about Hawaii. Yeah, we're all, we all hate the cop that pulls us over and gives us a ticket. You know what I mean? It, or arrested us for theft when we were 16 because we were stealing gum from Long's. But for the most part, we all know a cop. Everybody in Hawaii's got a cousin or an uncle or a grandfather or a nephew or a Hanai brother or a sister who's a policeman. And they all live in our communities. Every one of you has a police officer that lives in your neighborhood if you live in Hawaii. You have 2,100 police officers scattered around a 30 by 45 mile island that's mostly mountain and farm. So chances are there are several police officers that live in your community. I once rented a room. I once rented a house in Hawaii Kai that a police officer lived in and I didn't know it. I rent, I applied for this house. We got the rental, moved in. And after I moved in, <clears throat> the landlord said, oh, the person before you is a policeman. That's how many policemen there are. Like I re-rented a house that a policeman was in, in a neighborhood in Kulio. There's that many. And so Hawaii understands that they're in the community. That doesn't excuse them from being a douchebag. If you're a cop and you're a douchebag, they're going to call you on it. And yes, I've met a few douchebags with a badge. Statistically, it's going to happen. So shout out to Hawaii for that. You guys stood up. 
You said no more of this nonsense. We care more about the policemen that were doing their job that had to make that decision than we did that criminal who was robbing and stealing and purse snatching in a stolen car, endangering pedestrians, endangering people that were driving down Kalaniana Ole. The cops did not make that bad decision. That boy did. And it's sad that he was young. And it's sad that he didn't have a life. My heart breaks for him because his, his family sucks. Say what you will. He did not grow up in a good home. He just didn't. Look at Mark. Look at um, Maruo. Look at the Kaimi Ola, the sister. They never grew up in a good home. And yeah, this is what happens. You know what's messed up? At one point, he was probably a sweet little boy. But we're not talking about at one point. At that moment, he was a danger to our community in Honolulu. And he's no longer a danger. And it didn't have to go that way. He could have put his hands outside the car, put the keys on the hood, he could have stepped out of the car, walked backwards to the sound of the officer's voice, got on the ground in the prone position, put his hands behind his back, crossed his ankles, and went to jail. That's where he went wrong. In that moment. It doesn't matter. You could throw out all the stuff that happened weeks before then. But what happened in the last 20 minutes of his life cost it. And it's tough to talk about. It's tough to talk about because you want to have grace. You want to have mercy. You want to have compassion. And I have a son. I have an 11 year old. And it will be sad if when he's 16 years old, he steals a car, robs a woman, and purse snatches an old lady, and then leads police on a five-mile police chase in traffic, and then doesn't listen to police when they stop him, draw their guns, puts it in driver reverse, and revs that engine. Yeah, he was sweet when he was 11. But in that moment... What he did cost his life. So we, we got to overcome the narrative that those police officers wanted to shoot him. I never met a policeman that wanted to shoot anybody. It even messes with your head. You ask yourself all the time, could I do it? Most people, they like to flex and act like they would. Even cops. They're like, oh, I'd shoot him. Right? He charged me with a knife, I'm going to shoot him. He pulls out that gun, I'm going to shoot him. They like to tell themselves that, but... Bro, I bet you it's 50-50. I bet you half of them wouldn't pull the trigger. But that day, in April, I remember Psycap... Cy he met the officer that was a part of that 50-50. Willing to pull the trigger to save a life. Sometimes you got to save a life. Sometimes you got to take a life to save a life. And dude, when you're out there with your brothers, the guys who are... Think about, this ain't the first time they've been to a case like this. This ain't their first stolen vehicle. We call it a Code 10. This ain't their first Code 10. It ain't their first robbery. Zero three zero.
They deal with this stuff every day. And when you go to cases like that with your brothers, the dudes who take care of you, you want to take care of them. And they were in danger that day. Ooh, sorry, I got to get off my soapbox. Cam T says, any backlash coming to Alm? I'm sure there's backlash coming to Alm. You seen those people out in the streets? You seen what Alakea looks like? What hotel in Alakea has looked like? Yeah. There's going to be some um, backlash. It is my opinion that Steve Alm caved to public opinion because he was new and he thought it was better to err on this side of it than on the other side of it. But it cost those officers too much. But thank you for the question. Any other questions? What's up, Shanna? Shanna, am I saying it? Am I saying it right or is it Shanna? But I'm gonna say Shanna until you correct me. Shanna's always coming out. Appreciate you, Shanna. Kimmy Manson. What's up, Kim? Big John Stud. He says, How's it, Hawaiians? <laughs> Jensen Chang. Uh, dropped a little too much info on the live chat and retracted the message. I feel you, bro. Habit Lacrosse, how you doing, Habit? Says, I know one of the officers. He's a good dude. That's good to hear. I honestly bet they're all good dudes. I've heard nothing but good stuff from police officers about them. PJ Tanag says, Honolulu needs DK back. Thank you, PJ. They're holding down just fine. That would have been on my beat. I would have been on that scene. I would have been at that shooting. Glad I wasn't, man. Kingston Pride says, Parents. That's what it is. Not just the parents, it's the community. But yeah, the parents are huge. Because parents can overcome the community. If they, you live in a bad community, but you're good parents, you can be proactive and you can still raise your kids right. But it's hard for a community to overcome bad parents. It's hard to have bad parents and somehow the community redeem those children. Because the parents are in the home. Kim says, neither have I, but you don't see me out here acting like baby's kids. I don't like shooting people, but as you cannot be violating other safety. Right. If some dude came to my house trying to violate the safety of my family, he's getting shot. Flying Hoyne, he says, how's that? Allah, what's up, Flying Hoyne? Thanks for coming through. Shauna, I like that. Shauna. All right, I'll say it right from now on, okay? It's, more, it's probably Shauna, yeah? It's probably Shauna. Space Cowboy, does the department have a SWAT team to handle stuff like this? Do we even need one? The department does have a SWAT team. The SWAT team is called SSD. It's a specialized services division. It is a dedicated division, not like a lot of departments that have people, officers who are on patrol, who are then cross-deputized as like SWAT officers who carry their go bag, all their gear in their trunk, and then if something happens, they get activated. That's not how it works in Honolulu. In Honolulu, our SSD is dedicated. There's about 50 officers, if I'm not mistaken, and all they do is work out, Train tactics, go to trainings, um, you know, practice all their formations, practice all their policies. They train their dogs. They have bomb sniffing dogs and all that stuff. Um, they will serve warrants and 
um, things like that to in dangerous situations with people that have guns. So they do have a SWAT team. The thing about the SWAT team, or I'm just going to call them SSD because that's what they are. They are throughout the island doing things. They could be on a training on the West um, Coast or the west side of the island. They could be central. They could be at the station, which is only like, I don't know, a mile away from where this happened. And they would get activated and sent out. But this happened too quick. So we're not going to use SSD for the car chase because officers are trained to handle that. And those decisions need to be made fast because if you look at the photos. Let me see. Can I share this? I'm going to try to share a photo with you guys. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, let me sh let me um share this for you. So that you guys know what a scene would look like. So, in that thing that I just sent you guys, You can see that scene. It's in a neighborhood. There's people everywhere. It's right on a street. Kalakaua is mad busy. Everybody takes Kalakaua from Waikiki to get up to Baratani to go westbound through um, Honolulu. Oh, somebody in the super chat. PJ Tanag, 20 bucks. Thank you, sir. I appreciate you. Thank you very much. I appreciate the love and support. Always out here supporting, man. You're really something special. Thank you for that. And if you look at that photo that I posted right there, um, it's like a, especially this time of day, rush hour, Um, it says here, I believe it's four o'clock. I might be wrong, but everybody who comes from the east side of Oahu, that's not on the H1 freeway. Anybody taking Kalana on Ole, anybody in, um, Mo'ili'ili, um, anybody, Ho'ikai, Kahala, everybody from that side is going to come up. If they're not taking the H1, they're going to take Kalani. Um, they're, or even if they do take H1, let's say they want to go somewhere in town, they're going to exit by the university side and they're going to come up Kapilani or Vineyard and they're going to run into Kalakaua, Baratania. You got to go anywhere. All the action is between Baratania and King. I should say between Kapiolani and Baratania. For the most part. Anything you need in town is going to be between Kapiolani and Baratania. So you're going to take that route. That's a fire lane. It's two lanes going north, two lanes going south. It's a boulevard. It has that grassy knoll in the middle. Everybody's taking that. So you got tons of people. So it's a crazy thing to think. I mean, the community is there. It's in the community. This isn't uh, off in the country somewhere. This isn't Wailua in the cane fields. So you don't want to have to wait for our SSD to come and address this. These police officers are trained for this. They train really, really well. And this is what they're trained for, the felony traffic stop. Did they probably do some things wrong as far as policy that violated policy? Probably. Probably did. As far as policy. I'm assuming. Oh. Your experience and perspective is much appreciated. Mary Palafox. Thank you, Mary. Thank you for the live chat. I appreciate you. Man, always out here. You're the best. Thank you so much. That's a blessing. That really, really is. Oh, Kim Manson on with the $20 super chat. Thank you, Kim. 
Thank you so much. Day one. From day one, Kim's been out here on the live streams. Man, that's awesome. Thank you, guys. Brokart Wolf says, yep, I stay Kalihi. Lots of action here recently, too, with game rooms, etc. Yeah. Yeah. Kalihi's its own beast. So, I hope I answered your question about SSD. And then, um, Johnny Walker says, I sent a link to your Facebook DM. It's a post from my boy who's retired HPD major crimes detective sergeant. He worked with the judge and prosecutor in the past. Check him out. I'll check him out. Thank you for that. I appreciate you. I'll do that for sure. Kyline, so does that mean they can go back on the road? It means they can go back on the road. Now, I don't know when because they're going to have internal investigations still. There's still an internal investigation that has to happen. So how it works is the prosecutors have started their investigation, tried to bring them to trial. There will be no case. So we know that. But now the police department, which had to open every single shooting, every single shooting has to be investigated by internal affairs we call PSO. It means Professional Standards Office. PSO is investigating. That takes months sometimes. However, I will say this. These officers are going to go through mental evaluations now. They're going to have to go through psychologists. They're not going to be just let back on the road. There's a lot that has to happen. Just internal things. Because the police department is thinking about liability. So the police department has to think, what if they shoot somebody again? That's real. Because remember, the department is going to pay money. You watch the department is going to pay money to I remember Psychap's family. If they haven't already. Does anyone know? I think they did. I'm not sure. I'm going to look that up right now. I don't see anything. Good. So that means that probably didn't pay anything yet, but they will. They oftentimes will make those payments before the trial is finished just to get it over with. So they don't got to go through with the um, lawsuit. But I have an, I have a, article here that I'm going to put here in the chat for you guys. It was done by KHON. Um, it says city taxpayers like, likely to pay legal fees for three HPD officers charged in the fatal shooting. And this is said in like a negative way. Like somehow it's the, it's somehow it's the department's fault that these officers did this and now the city has to pay for, it's insane. Of course they will. Of course they will. Get it in your heads already. If a policeman is being charged with murder and it was approved by the department what he did, you, you're, you're right. The police department is going to have to pay. And the police department is the city and county of Honolulu. It's just what it is. And thank God. We can't have police officers just paying their own legal bills, legal bills and expect officers to go to work. I'm not going to work if I got to pay for myself. 
The real problem with paying for this case is it never should have went. What does it say about a prosecutor who pushes through the case when a grand jury, members of the actual public? Okay, if you have two rooms. In one of the rooms, you have 15 people from your community. Anti-Crystal. Lola... Carol, Cousin Kimo, all in one room, and then in another room, you have a prosecutor who is an actual politician. Dude's elected. Who's more in the community? The prosecutor? Or all those people that you see at barbecues, you see at luau's, you see at 4th of July when you go to Alamona Beach Park to watch the fireworks. That's your community. Your community said there wasn't enough probable cause. And, and remember, the argument will be, yeah, but they're not experts. Probable cause has nothing to do with experts. Probable cause has to do with reasonable, a reasonable person of your community would make that right decision. It's literally your community. So you have a prosecutor elected who says that your community didn't do what they were supposed to do. And then he pushes it through. This never should have went. Those officers should sue the city. 100%. They will never ever, ever recover from what has happened to them. It's just not going to happen. There's no coming back from this. So Kai, I hope I answered your question. They can go back on the road, but it's probably going to be a little bit. Habit Lacrosse says, is crime worse now than when you first started or is social media just making us more aware of the problems around us? It is not worse. Different crimes, the crime has shifted. There's a bigger problem in the Micronesian community, I will say that. From the time I started to the time I left, the problems that we had in the Micronesian community were like this. And I don't know why. There's something going on that needs to be addressed. Politically, between the community leaders and the state of Hawaii. So there's got to be something. The embassy's got to get involved. Hawaii needs help. They just do. But crime was worse in 1970 than it is now. Believe it or not. I got proof. Actually, we talk about it on the Patreon, right? And I'm going to get into that. Um, we are starting the eight-week series. Chapter 7 of Honolulu Homicide deals with the Honolulu Strangler. And the very first week, we're going to talk about crime in Honolulu and what it was like leading up to it, what the uh, culture, what the environment, the criminal environment was like when all this stuff started. And you'll learn that even in the 70s and in the 80s, the crime was worse. The murders were insane. Dude, the amount of people that were murdered was insane. I could show you like weeks in 1986 where seven people were murdered in seven days. Unrelated. So crime is getting better every single year in Hawaii. It just appears crazier because of the media. Derek uh, Okabayashi says, Washington Middle School, next street over to, yeah. Right behind Zippy's, yeah. God, I love that Zippy's. I used to do uh, special duty that Zippy's every month at least on Saturday nights. Friday and Saturday nights. 
and always had the kids causing trouble. Had the game rooms, had plenty of trouble at Macaulay Q. Um, Haoli Street is right there. And down Haoli Street had tons of problems and everybody would cut. And then it had Fern. Was it called Fern? Kim, you're right. Crime is getting better. What does that even mean? So funny. I should say there is less crime now than there was. So I'm going to share this. If you guys want to click on it and follow with me. This is the Google Maps link. Washington Middle School. right there so on that top side of Washington Middle School has the Zippies McCulley right by the basketball courts tennis courts and if you take that street Philip is what it was if you take um, Philip Street so at the bottom of Washington Middle has Philip Philip Street and that's where it was the corner of Philip Kalakaua Crazy. You know how many times I've been at Philip and Kalakaua? My good B partner busted his ankle, broke his ankle or whatever on that corner. We was chasing a guy that dug out from us, ducked into the canal right there. There's a canal that runs with Kalakaua behind the houses. Um, Hawaii Palm Mom says, I believe the judge made the right decision here. I do too. Define diligence. Aloha's Doug. Aloha, define diligence. Thanks for coming out. That's a dope name. Hawaii Palm Mom says, I don't believe so. I think Corporation Council is looking at it, though. Yeah. Uh, Corporation Council. So Corporation Council will determine whether or not they're going to pay for your trial if you follow policy and procedure and then the unions will fight for you if the department says they're not gonna shauna says as i as a taxpayer have no problem paying for this case i don't either at this i mean at this point i don't either it never should have happened though right like now it's like yeah now defend these guys but it never had to even go that far active ambition aloha brother doug mahalo for all the content keep up the awesome work thank you for all the support i appreciate you always coming out skyline leather co says i just saw the notification awesome news yeah it was Kingston's Pride says, those 70s were the days. Yeah, man. 70s was rough. I wonder when... I know that there was a huge change in policing after the Honolulu Strangler. Also ways that people acted it was almost as if before the honolulu strangler there was an innocence in hawaii because you know you guys all know what i mean people in hawaii know what i mean when i say hawaii's behind the rest of the world and it's a good thing they got target last and costco last and sam's club last 
And things that hit in the mainland, they, they always make it to Hawaii, but late. Well, crime is the same way. The rest of the world was experiencing serial killers. for the. It was like the first time in modern day since technology that we had started seeing a rise in serial crimes. Hawaii didn't have theirs for a while. And they still had this sweet innocence. And then when the Honolulu Strangler happened in 85, 86, all of a sudden girls were disappearing from bus stops. Beautiful young women just disappearing and being found days later chopped up or should be, should say strangled. And once that happened, all of a sudden Hawaii was like, wow, it can happen here. And it did. And then we did, we had one more serial killer. I think I know who he was. I'm going to talk about that on the Patreon. 15 years after the Honolulu Strangler. And then, um, then there are things that really change for police officers. I know that the Xerox shooting, that changed a lot for policing in, in Hawaii. I know that... Um, Columbine changed a lot in Hawaii. It changed policing everywhere in the world. Um, and then the Troy Barboza shooting, that changed policing in Hawaii. Because a police officer was murdered by a criminal that he was working on a case against. And so I love when people say we got to stop with the fear-based policing because you don't know what you're talking about. Policing is fear-based, even if it's proactive. You're policing because the community is afraid. Proactive police work is there to ease fear. Do you know that police officers in the Honolulu Police Department are required to have their blue lights on in certain situations. And during certain times, they are required just to show presence, to park in certain areas just with their light on so everyone can feel safer. What does everyone have to feel safe about? Unless they're afraid. So fear-based policing was a term that they're trying to use to turn into accusing police officers of profiling. But that's nonsense. Pamela Bermuda says, the Hawaii public pays both ways for the officer's attorneys and eventual SICAP family settlement. And, might I add, the police officer's settlement. They're going to sue. They need to sue. There might be something... There may be something that protects them. But there should be lawsuits, if it's possible. Because these officers will never recover. Financially, they'll never recover. The department will pay them back pay for, like, overtime work. They know that if they were working overtime usually, and now they weren't because they've been on light duty. Because remember, you cannot... When you're on... ROPA, which we call ROPA, R-O-P-A means release of police authority or restriction of police authority. You cannot work special duty. And you all live in Hawaii. You know how hard it is to live in Hawaii on a single income with no overtime? So the officers work overtime. Why do they work overtime? Because their beats are light. Because you got a sector, you got four sectors in District 1, 1, 2, 3, and 4. You might have two people in a, in a sector. An entire sector, Chinatown and downtown, are one sector. Take all of Chinatown from Liliha all the way to Bishop. That's sector one, all the way from the water. From Honolulu Harbor 
all the way up to the mountain, to the freeway. That's one sector. You might have two people, three people, two people on a bad night. When they're fully staffed, they're good. You got one five zero, one five one two, one five four, one five five six, one five seven. You got six or seven beats in sector one. You might have four officers. That's crazy. They don't have officers, so they call in people to work overtime. And when there's not overtime, they work special duty. But when you're on Europa, you cannot do that because you're working at the desk. You might cut your, your salary by 30%. So these guys lost tons of money, plus all the drama and the death threats. Everywhere they go now, they got to think about where they walk. They already had to. But most police officers' faces aren't blasted across the internet and the TV. And this is why police officers don't want their names to be released when they get suspended or when they get reprimanded for doing something wrong at work. Because oftentimes these cases are overturned it's someone just being overzealous in PSO or whatever, and they get overturned. And now they don't, they didn't do anything wrong. It was ruled for them, but now their name's all over the place. Now their face all over the place. And then those police officers got to go to Sam's Club. They live on an island, they're going to have to move off the island. They're going to have to move out of Hawaii, out of the state, if they want to get away from that. I got nine minutes. Okay. Um, how's that 808? 808 Toyota truck. Thanks for coming through. Jessica Ramos says, you should do the Troy Barboza murder case. That is an interesting one. Happened in Manoa in the 80s, if I'm not mistaken. Jessica, I'm doing that um, over on my Patreon. We're going to talk about that. It's uh, probably two months away, but I already have it on the docket. If I'm not mistaken, Gary Diaz talks about it in one of his books. And so we're definitely going to get into that one. I used to do the Troy Barboza run. Um... I think it's for Special Olympics. But dude, that he was a good dude. Stacked to yote. I think he was narco. He'd gone undercover, a bunch of stuff. And then the dude who, some dude in California who was standing trial, some gangster. I think he was a blood. He flew out to Hawaii, shot Troy Barboza through his front window of his house as he laid on his couch at home. Murdered him in cold blood. Space Cowboy, you think you're going to come back to Hawaii, to HPD, Uncle Doug? No. Uh, I'm not going to come back to HPD. I might come back to Hawaii at some point. I made a money move out here, and the goal is to be able to grab a place in Hawaii in a few years. Kingston Pride said, no, I get flashbacks. Pansave, Pan Pan Winter City Shopping Center. We were behind, but now we got evil people who infected our islands. Yep. Well, always had evil people. First they stole them. Now they're infecting them. In a week of effed up national decision making and impacts, it's such a relief for justice and all that should be right in the world that Judge Domingo called it right from Aloha sh um, Shore You. Yeah, so I agree, man. This was a breath of fresh air from all the crazy stuff we've been seeing. William Domingo. Maybe 
the second most, maybe 30% of all my arrests were seen by Judge Domingo during my career. I seen his name on the warrants all the time. Maybe the second most popular name on the warrants was Judge Domingo. And man, I, I, I'm glad that he ruled that way. You know why I'm glad? Because that's the truth. I'm not, I wasn't looking for special treatment. I wanted the truth. I wanted us to stop ignoring and pretending like we weren't seeing what we were seeing. Habit Lacrosse says, I got to run. Thanks for staying up late for us. Have a good one, Doug. Mahalo's Habit, I appreciate you as always. Always looking out. Thank you for coming out. You're the best. Um, I was told not to release info to telephone info, et cetera, when you got into law enforcement to let Argentina know that LEO was when I scheduled a visit. Not to release info to telephone info, et cetera. When I got into law enforcement or let Argentina know I was LEO, I was scheduled to visit. Yeah. I don't I wouldn't let nobody know. Back then, you had to call the telephone company and have your number unlisted, right? Now you got to go through all this stuff where you got to go to like true people search and get your name removed. And I had to write letters to all these people to get my information pulled off the internet when I became a policeman because you walk around, everybody that you see, they see your name. How many D, how many D Karenics do you, were there in Hawaii? There's only two in the world. And my dad died. I was the only one left. So they're going to find me. And you think about that. You just try not to work in your own district. I got four minutes left. So you try not to work in your own district that you live in so you can drive somewhere and get away so you don't see the crumbs that you arrest every day, especially when you're a good policeman and you're arresting bad guys. So you don't let anybody know. Nobody knew. The department couldn't even find me. One day I forgot to show up to work. And policy when you forget to show up to work at the Honolulu Police Department is they send an officer to your house because you might be dead. That's because of Troy Barboza. If a policeman doesn't show up and doesn't call, they send somebody to your home. Well, I lived in Kalihi on Rose Street just before Meyer on the left-hand side. And it's in like a, one of those Filipino compounds with compounds all around me and it was shaped like a U and you go into it and there's houses on all sides you don't know they share a driveway there's a hundred doors and I'll never forget uh, waking up one day I heard somebody it's super early it's like 6 45 in the morning so we had line up at what 6 6 a.m headline up 6 45 heard a guy saying doc hey doc a Filipino guy dog and I woke up to hearing him whisper yelling you know that whisper yell and I look out my window and I see him standing like two fences over in somebody else's yard just looking at all the big Filipino compounds that are massive I don't know how they get permits to build massive they come this close to each other and he's like dog and I look out and I was like oh Richie he's like dog where you at I can't I don't know where you at and I was like, I'm over here. And I had to go outside. And he's like, shoot, you're supposed to work today. Sarge sent me over here to check on you. And I thought I was working the next day. I thought it was my day off. So you don't tell anybody where you live for that reason. You don't want somebody to be able to find you. Kingston Pride. He's taken over the chat with the uh, reunion. The Windward the Windward City Shopping Center reunion. Shauna says, oh, okay, so the judge been justice for a while. Yep, judge been around a while. All right, Kim, thanks for coming out. Appreciate you. Shauna, he said 100 doors. Filipino Winch Winchester houses. She's living that dream. Cool. Hey, thank you guys so much for coming out. I'm happy that these officers don't have to stand trial. We'll see what happens on the um, appeal. But you guys are the best. Thank you so much for all the love, all the support. If you want to join the Patreon, head on over to patreon.com slash Doug Karenik. And go sign up. You'll find my link in all my bios and my link tree. Uh, sign up for a dollar. If you can't afford it, hit me up, DM me, and let me know. And I'll make sure I, I send you those links so you can be a part. We're having a blast. We're going deep on the Honolulu Strangler. 
So you don't want to miss it. Go check it out. And um, I'm going to release a video soon. I got some big stuff I want to tell you guys. Some, uh, well, I'll leave it at that. So I appreciate you guys. Thank you so much for coming out. And until the next time, aloha.